Greetings to all. We find ourselves in a very different circumstance, don't we? And the Lord's people are uh, remote from one another. Uh, we are distant in a way that we never really expected to be. But in these times, it's good to read from the Word of God. And we want to read from a familiar passage to us, Luke chapter 24. And while you're turning that up, I just want to, to thank you for the opportunity, Brother Nathan Young asked me to produce a, midi a ministry video for the Amondale Gospel Hall. And, well, this is a new thing for me and certainly a challenge, but we trust that the Lord will give help as we, as we look at his words, and that's more important than anything else. So let's read together then from Luke 24, and, of course, a familiar passage. I will read in verse 1 of the chapter. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Now down the chapter a little while until we get to uh, where Peter comes in, just for connection there in verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and the other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter, and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departing, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Now we want to really look at the Emmaus road journey, so if you'll bear with me, we'll Read into that uh, from verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were folding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in uh, Jerusalem, and hast not, not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty uh, in deed uh, and, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted, we hoped, that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not the body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it, even so, as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools and wise, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and they made as though he would have gone further. And uh, he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in uh, to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and break and gave to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight, 
and he said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour, and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how that he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spoke, or thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Now, down the chapter, it's a rather lengthy reading reading so far, but just for a, a verse or two, and verse 50, And he led them out as far as Beth, to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Now we've read together this lovely chapter in Luke's uh, Gospel. It's been described as the, it's probably the greatest book in the whole world. And I suppose from a scholar's point of view, uh, if, if the scholars are saying that, the, the Greek language is tremendous and also, of course, the content is tremendous as well to us. It is, certainly, I've never read all the books in the world, I don't suppose anybody has, but it is certainly one of the loveliest uh, accounts and, of course, inspired by God and that raises it again to a far greater plane altogether when we think about it. It is God's Word and here the record stands indelibly on the page of Scripture Regarding the Lord Jesus, how wonderful to see that he is risen and he appears to his people, Jesus himself, through near. And we're going to touch upon some uh, of the aspects of this, even this passage and some of the verses that we've read together. And the danger is, well, it's so familiar, but the, maybe the danger for me is that I'll omit some of the lovely aspects of it all uh, as we look upon it again tonight. May it be fresh to us at least. You know, Paul, when he's writing um, in First Corinthians chapter 14, he's, he, he talks about uh, how that ministry can be for edification, exhortation and comfort. And I suppose that in these days, certainly, we're looking towards the, the, last, of, the last of these, but uh, it's not exclusive. It is a ministry of comfort, but it never comes, of course, without, challenge, without its challenge in the Word of God. And so we want to really look at the chapter. Many have commented upon it. I won't spend a lot of time thinking about this, about the open things that are in, uh, are within the, the, the confines of this chapter. There is their eyes, of course, open the, their understanding. Verses 31, 32, 45, you'll see that. And an open sepulchre and an empty tomb. And again, as we think about it, a risen Christ. He's ascended. And of course, the gospel starts with that concept of, of a priestly man uh, going in and uh, of the believers, the uh, saints around him uh, who were waiting for Zechariah coming out again. And now at the end of the gospel, we see again the priest. Of course, it is our great high priest and he has his names upon his shoulder and in his heart he bears them and he knows them and he knows the concerns of his people and he's entered into heaven itself and that's where he'll come from again at one day so we're looking forward to that but this is a new dispensation as well and as a result of him entering in the spirit of God has come to and so this is the dispensation when we have a man in glory and the spirit of God in earth but we're thinking tonight of this journey home this homeward journey and we want to Sort of a, a sort of a make something of that. I know that they went back to the disciples. We're going to see that, but uh, we just think of these disciples, the two on the road to Emmaus. Now that they were going home to 
Emmaus that night. And they started off rather despondent, I would think, in deep despair. You can see them with their head bowed down on the dusty road. They're maybe a bit dispirited, they're quite low. And uh, here they are along that road, and it leads them as they wind their way back to their home at Emmaus. And there's a burden upon them. There's a sense of helplessness and loss, isn't there, as they take their journey homeward. And that is, I just want to apply that to us on our homeward journey as well. We've been under lockdown. The circumstances have not been great for us. And many as a person has went through a trial and, well, some of the saints have been spared that, ourselves included. Job loss, all the sorts of things that you could experience. The loss of life would be far greater, of course. Uh, but, you know, some have experienced that and, uh, and terrible circumstances, funerals not being what they would have been, marriages uh, not being able to take place, all these kinds of things. And we have now sought to elaborate a little upon that. But there are far more personal circumstances that you know about yourself. So as they're going along, they're on this pathway and we've not forgotten that we are strangers. We are strangers away from home and we are pilgrims. Peter talks about that. And we're going home. We're going home one day. We'll be with the Lord forever. So here's a couple, I think. Well, it's, you might say it's speculative. It's speculative either way to say that they're a couple or to maybe say they're not because the details are not there. But you see, they have the one home. Uh, maybe they are crusty bachelors, it's maybe unlikely, uh, living together. Uh, but, you know, uh, especially in these days, but you see, the speculation uh, that we would want to put forward is that they are simply a couple. They have the one heart, their heart, their heart burned within them, didn't it? And uh, they have the one home, and they're going to have hospitality in that home, as we'll see. And they take now what is a seven-mile journey uh, home. It would take a couple of hours to get there, wouldn't it? I don't know what the, the terrain was really like, uh, but they take a, a seven-mile journey. It might have been difficult roads or easy, but it would have taken a few hours anyway to go all the way back. But, you know, they would have rocketed. <laughs> and the return journey, it would have been so different, wouldn't it? But we'll think about that. So in verse 13, it says, they went the same day, that same day, you know it's the third day and uh, it seems that, that things have come now to a climax and their despondency is quite high and they think well nothing's going to happen now we'll just turn away from things and how often it is the case that maybe we would feel like that just when things seem so bad and at the worst ebb well and in the, in the darkest moments that's when the Lord will really draw near and we're going to see that is exactly what happens they go on their route back as we've been saying and they talk together of these things in verse number 14 it says of all those things which had happened they talked together they were communing together so here they are now conversing over the, these things and as in verse 15 it says they communed together and reasoned they tried to get a, a sort of a grip on and what was what had happened around them and their conversation was all around the events that had happened there, these were momentous events it had rocked our world it had shook them to the core and the experience was still raw and you know you just apply that to circumstances that you find yourself in tonight and they turned over in their minds the events you know there are sometimes we can't get away from the events of life, they, they, they seem to come in upon us, the trials and problems, and they get a grip of us. Well, here are people just like that, just like you and I, and with these things fresh in their minds, it is there, you know, that the Lord will draw an eye. Isn't it good that their thoughts were centred around his things right enough, and that they, are, they were, you know, a bit like the children of Israel, it says that, it was really all of Christ, wasn't it? The rock that they followed was, was the, the cloud that they followed was Christ, and the rock that followed them was Christ, and the gathering of the manna, it was Christ, and the lamb that they had 
you know, partaken up, uh, upon when their souls were redeemed out of Egypt. It was all Christ, wasn't it? And they were on redemption ground. They were uh, away uh, from uh, Egypt and from the world and they were on redemption ground. The Revelation tells us about that, that it was freshly slain. Chapter 5, the Lamb, as it had been freshly slain. Chapter 13, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And we think of the freshness of Calvary and think of fresh thoughts of our Lord Jesus Christ. We too can be privileged to have such thoughts and we too have been bought by a price like them and the children of Israel certainly had their focus and attention upon the person of the Lord Jesus. That was certainly what all the types and shadows were speaking about and the conversation here, as we've said, it centres around him. It wasn't the mundane, the frivolous, and the time was spent thinking about, really about his things and about himself. And so it is just at those moments uh, when the Lord will draw nigh to us and he knows our needs. You know, <laughs> when we get back to things, it may be that we'll not be able to sing. One of the hymns that we like to sing, if we could, is number 318 in our book. And it says this, we'll sing of the shepherd who died. No subject so glorious as he, no theme so affecting to us. One of the great other three sixteens of our Bible is found in the book of Malachi. And in Malachi, we uh, hear, uh, we, we read of uh, a book that, of remembrance being written. And it's written regarding those that fear the Lord, those that f think upon, those that thought upon his name. And the Lord knows them and he writes them, these takes cognizance of them, writes them in a book, records them there and we think about those things. But when they, we are contemplating the events just like these are, they are thinking in detail about all those things that have happened. They are thinking about uh, as they communed and, and reasoned, they, they, they certainly they were investigating upon these things and trying to make sense of it. You know, the Lord had prepared his disciples. He had said to them in the upper room, it was he himself who prepared them, and it was he himself who said, let not your heart be troubled. So for troubled hearts, he always has the answer, doesn't he? Now that doesn't always penetrate, and of course, we know that there's a purpose behind all the trials of life. They don't happen by accident. And there's at least, at least three reasons that I can think of anyway, and probably more, that the Lord uh, brings trials into our experience, just like these two here. It is for the development of our character, and it is for the discipline in our lives, and it is, of course, to produce dependence upon himself. And Peter talks about that. He says the trial of your faith. And so that trial of faith, it might be, it's more precious than gold. It perishes, he says. It might be tied with fire. It might be found to praise and honour and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every son he receives, he chastens. And so the idea of discipline is there. Not only the trial of life that brings and produces, you know, dependence and development of character but and the discipline of the but the discipline of life for he disciplines every son it's a proof to us isn't it that we belong to him because he chastens us and brings us into his school and of course no chastening for the present says the hebrew writer as he goes on in chapter 12 he says it doesn't seem to be very joyous of course not it's grievous but afterward afterward you know, it can then yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness then. You know, Newton was famous for a number of hymns, and one of them, he he, he says this for, for us to sing, I suppose, I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, more might know of his uh, salvation, know, and seek more earnestly his face. Instead of this, he goes on to say, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart. 
These inward trials I employ, in one of the verses he says, from self and pride to set thee free, and break thy schemes of earthly joy, that thou mightst find thy all in me. Trials are not always punitive, you know, but they can be corrective. And it may just be that we've gone in the wrong direction and the Lord would seek to bring us back in again. But, you know, Job's friends discovered that it wasn't always that the person had done wrong, but actually there was a refining process going on and those trials were for uh, to bring uh, Job into line with God and into God's mind and for God's glory. Now, we've said too much in that, probably. We want to get back to things here in verse 15. It was while they were communed, it was while that happened, that as Jesus himself then drew near and he went with them. You see, we have all the questions when it comes to these problems of life, but he's got all the answers and he drew near to them. And we discover that, don't we? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, they had the problem, Martha and Mary. They had the issues. They they, they wondered what had happened to Lazarus. Uh, but, you know, the Lord Jesus gives them an answer, which is far better than just simply what would happen. Their brother raised again, but he gives them something of himself and he shows something of his character. He says, look, you just need me. <laughs> he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that's enough for us, isn't it? And we need to grasp on to that. Many of the Lord's people know what it is to have that kind of grief. We've spoken about some of the problems that we've been facing. For some, it's financial. For some, it's depression, maybe. For some, they're in constant pain and suffering. For others, we turn to the world at, at large. There are those that are being persecuted for the name of Christ all over it. And we admire them. We look at their fortitude. We wonder how they can carry on in these trials. And we trust that we'll know this the very fellowship of Christ in it all, that he himself would draw an eye and he would show himself as the one that would go with them. Jesus himself, it emphasises who it is, of course, it emphasises that is the real person. We, we talk about uh, saying that he told me himself, it really is an emphatic thing, we know it's really that's the person that, is uh, in view and so we we think of him jesus himself and the lord himself of course he's going to descend from heaven again the emphasis is placed on who it is we're going to remind ourselves of his present ministry that he himself he draws an eye that he himself sees the need that he himself is uh, conscious of the difficulties you know there's only so much we can do with remote working uh, I'm glad to be able to do that in my job. But there's only so much when it comes to the actual dealing with individuals and uh, and actually getting to grips with how they're feeling and uh, and to, be, uh, to have some kind of empathy with them, to know really their hearts. Isn't it good that the Lord draws an eye? Paul talks about it like this. He talks about the God of all comfort, doesn't he? He says that in those trials... We have been comforted by God so that we might be able to comfort others. In Second Corinthians chapter two, uh, chapter one and verse four, we ourselves are comforted of God. Then he says, But God comforted us by the coming of Titus. Isn't it good that you know that you could be like Titus in that circumstance? He brought news of the Corinthians and, and how they had responded to, to Paul's ministry. But isn't it good to be able to bring something, yes, like that, and to be able to comfort others? And, of course, the Lord is doing that. He's able to, to do that. Uh, and we can cast all our care upon him because, of course, he cares for us. And he knows the extent of the trials that we're in. He knows the end of the trials. He knows how much we can endure within these trials. It was the fourth watch of the night when the Lord uh, came to them when they were toiling and rowing and when he walked upon uh, the waves and uh, he was in the mountain top praying while well, they were uh, in the boat toiling and the Lord knew them and he came with those words be of good cheer it is I am he speaks to the, the wind and he rebukes 
the, the wind and of course there's going to be a great calm the storm is all a beast and of course the Lord is able to rise above all of that so what happens then in the experience of these uh, two on the road to Emmaus well the Lord is with them and we're looking for the persistent presence of Christ to have him in everyday experience to know him uh, and to have fellowship with him in our every every moment of every day and we need to be conscious of our need for that uh, we need to be aware of our own limitations and we need to recognize that we sin and we need to confess sin and so on to, to in order to have true fellowship with the lord jesus christ so the lord in verse 17 he he, he comes to them and says what manner of communications are these you're, you're so sad and in verse 17 he says you talk uh, as you have one with another as you walk and are sad. He recognises their condition. He gives them uh, uh, time to respond to him. He listens to them. He has all of that empathy. You see, here, here they are, they're walking. We could go into the details, I suppose, in a headline from the Ephesian epistle about the walk of the believer. And we could think about those things. But, you know, I, I, I want to leave that. You can think about that. But here we are, and they're walking sadly. And the Lord doesn't want that for us. You know, sometimes the Lord's people have been there. They've been broken-hearted. And I'm glad to think about him who can heal the broken-hearted. And that the Lord would come and draw an eye to us tonight, even in our despair at times that he can bring the cheer that we need, that he can bring a ministry to our hearts. And so we have to walk in different ways. We have tried to leave that to one side, we'll walk worthily, we have to walk in love, to walk as children of, of light, we have to walk circumspectly, we have to walk and to please God. And we think of the gentleness of the Lord now uh, as he questions them he recognizes their state and he gives them credence he's not dismissive of how they feel and we get a window into the lives of people sometimes we might actually have opportunities like this ourselves and we don't take them properly but the lord knows how to initiate a conversation with them and how to elicit answers from them how to wait for them to respond there's many of the lord's people who are painting a brave face on things they won't maybe tell you everything others you know my father used to say he wasn't a christian he used to say you know the creaking doors they last the longest uh, but you know others are happy to share all their feelings but we need to balance that up don't we and we want to sometimes even then we don't know the the truth of how how folk really feel well the lord is able to to help in these circumstances you remember that the psalmist, he says, he restoreth my soul. And it takes the rod of correction and the staff, he says, well, they comfort me. And of course, these are guides to us, aren't they? Uh, we've thought of a minister of comfort, but it always comes with with the aspect of correction. It always comes with our responsibility as well in these things. We can't expect the Lord to, to do things for us when we're not prepared to, for example, as I say, be close to him and to want to abide with him and to have that desire. Now we love how the Lord is prepared to listen as they recount the story. And as he, as he does so uh, in verse 17, he's asked the question, what, what manner of communications are these? And of course Cleophas is quite incredulous in the next verse, verse 18. You see, what we've discovered is now that there's going to be a little telling again the returning home, verses 13 down to 17, and then there's now the, the, the opportunity for them to recount the story, the story of their Saviour. As they do so, uh, the uh, he says, Are you, you're the only stranger in Jerusalem. It's a kind of a, it's a, kind of a, a phrase that they used. And he, he's quite incredulous. Here is a, a sort of a... Um, turn of phrase that they had in that day that really says you you must you, you know it's you must be someone who's never even been around where have you been hiding it's almost like that isn't it and he says now i'll tell you all about this and they recount the story of the lord jesus who he was 
he was that prophet. And what he did, mighty and deed and word before God and all the people. And we, we love to tell the story of him. And so they told the story of the Lord Jesus as he uh, as he goes on to say he was one who was uh, delivered up, condemned to death. What had happened to him, not only who he was and what he did, but what happened to him, the treatment he received by the chief priest. He was delivered up, he was condemned, he was crucified and the nation was behind it all. Mr Flanagan, he came across a thing once I heard him say that uh, it was the guilt of the Jew, but it was a crime of the Gentile. It was the Romans that crucified him. But of course the Jewish nation, they were really responsible uh, to to put him to death. And the Lord, remember, had experienced all of this. Here he is listening to people telling about uh, the facts. <laughs> they recount the story. Oh, they might have went into more detail than we have just on this page. They crucified him. But you know, he experienced that, all of it. And in the hours of darkness, he experienced it all personally. But he listens to them nevertheless. And he hears them out. And of course, Peter takes this to a higher purpose when he says, He was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Both the sovereign aspect are there. God's counsel and foreknowledge and of course man's responsibility is there as well two things that we never need to reconcile Mr Spurgeon says they are friendly truths and we never need to reconcile friends so take that for what it's worth in verse 21 but we had hoped we'd trusted and the implication is that the the, the thought of resurrection is not there and of course if we've no resurrection no resurrection of Christ, Paul says, were of all men most miserable. Our preaching is vain, our faith is vain. Uh, it's built on thin air. There's no foundation. All our hopes, you see, as far as they were concerned, were dashed. And our confidence all shattered and our plans all ended. It would end at the grave, wouldn't it, if there was no resurrection. And they feel now cut adrift. They feel as if that's what's happened. And they say, well, wait a minute, it's a bit worse than what we've been first describing. Beside all of that, it's three days ago, you know, and that's not a confirmation to them. They say, well, it's three days, it's, you know, nothing's going to happen now, that's why they left off. And some of our women, you know, they came and they told us this story about angels. <laughs> and who could believe them? Quite dismissive of them. And when uh, some of our company went to see the, the sepulchre, well, it was right enough, it was empty, but, you know, they never saw the Lord. And so it was confirmed, but the Lord was listening to all this. And it was he who was abandoned there, forsaken at the cross, and he knew all about this. He knew all that they were going to say. So in verses 25 to 27, he begins to gently rebuke them. And then to reveal to them the things, as it says there, so wonderfully, concerning himself that they might need a gentle rebuke it does us no harm to experience the faithful wounds of a friend and immediately he brings in the comfort of the scriptures and the words of the Lord uh, they comfort them don't they they comfort them because their hearts are going to burn within them he says all that the prophets had spoken Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses and in all the scriptures he expounded unto them he interpreted the scriptures for them and their hearts were helped you know I suppose these things you know he said testify of me about the scriptures and they heard about the Messiah I wonder how he began that story. You can think about it yourself. Go back to Genesis. Think about the story of Cain and Abel, the sacrifice of Abel. Abraham and Isaac, perhaps. The Paschal Lamb 
of Exodus 12 would he have mentioned that the offerings of Leviticus the Psalms 22 and so on 69 Isaiah 53 I'm sure there's well there are there are many more scriptures besides these that we love and to have them interpreted by the Lord Jesus to really have picked out maybe ones that we would find totally obscure but to have them honed in and it was him and so they restrain him verses 28 to 29 and we must hurry on we've went a bit longer than we anticipated but they restrain him as if he had gone further and this is strong language now this is them urging and prevailing upon him they insisted that he would stay with them and the lesson is obvious that he would not go in uninvited he would not be, be where he wasn't wanted and he gives them the opportunity to he gives them the opportunity to act in this way he allows them to have that privilege of asking him and he knew in advance that he would ask them but he gives them the privilege and opportunity and that is you know where we are tonight do we want to as it were entertain strangers unawares do we want his presence to be with us and to to know him and in, in, in that personal way they restrain him and they bring him in to where they are and verses 30 to 31 he reveals himself to them we compare this to john in chapter 1 you see in john 1 they come to him two of the disciples of john baptist and they say rabbi where dwellest thou and he says come and see and he brings them into his home and he has fellowship with them and wherever it was that he was staying at that time and they were in his home but now he is in someone else's home christ in your home and look at what happens he takes the place as some have said of, of the host and he takes the bread it was a host that did that and I, we don't know was it the way he did it was it the words that he spoke when he was given thanks was it the wounds that they saw that uh, that boiled down and uh, and broke down their hearts and revealed to them well anyway we know it was this that their eyes were holding and it was god who revealed the moment the very moment when those that when the change would take place it was he who removed the scales from their eyes but it was just at that moment just at that appropriate juncture and so from heartache and trial they come to heartburn their heart burning within them my heart was hot within me says the psalmist while i was musing the fire burned they must have felt like that and so they retraced their steps must have been glad in heart it must have taken a shorter period of time to get back when they saw that the the with lighter hearts now and uh, and not heavy hearts they turned on their journey and they were they arrived and must have thought it was best to get back and encourage others and to share these things well uh, the others had already had experiences hadn't they and events had already come and it turned out actually that they couldn't get to tell the story because uh, the first thing was that they they heard from the rest that the Lord had already appeared and events had already ca- happened now this is one of several uh, around 13 resurrection appearances of the Lord and they stand uh, to strengthen each other there's experiences like uh, Mary Magdalene experiencing uh, the, the Lord's presence when he when he appeared to her alone and Peter you know in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 15 it tells us about that and the 500 at once and so on each of these stand to attest to the, the, the true validity of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus but uh, taken in their own right but bring them together and that it gives us a cohesive picture and of course it strengthens all of the uh, of this in terms of its confirmation but then in verse 36 to 43 we have this shared encounter that as they are talking about it 
that as they rose up, they gathered together with the rest that were there, uh, the, and heard those words. The Lord is risen indeed. They can get, they can get their own story, as we've said already. And then they told what happened. Then it says this, and as they thus spoke, as they thus spake, you see, they're talking again about the Lord, and it's just at that moment that he reveals himself to them. And he says, for it was Jesus himself. He says, look, Jesus himself again stood in their midst and he showed them the marks of Calvary. It was a shared encounter. And God himself, uh, the Lord Jesus himself, rather, he appeared in their midst. Well, we can say this, the cloudless day is nearing. That's another one of our hymns, isn't it? 262, thy wounds. Thy wounds, Lord Jesus. These deep, deep wounds will tell. The sacrifice that frees us from self and death and hell, these link thee once forever with all who own thy grace. No hand, these bonds can sever. No hand, these scars efface. And so you see, they're returning home. They recount their story. He rebukes them and reveals himself from Scripture. They retrace their steps. They rejoice together in the risen Lord. The Emmaus Road is just a picture of the dark pathway of Christian experience, but Jesus draws near. And we thought of this in closing. That he is the defender of the defenceless. He is the friend of the fatherless. <laughs> He's a sojourner with the saint. He lends his weight to the widow. He's the protector of his people. He takes the burden from the broken hearted and just go on and add to that if you want. Though all forsook him at the cross, he'll never forsake us. How good to know him on the journey of life. All Christ, from beginning to end, Israel's suffering Messiah, our glorified and risen Lord, to him that loved us and loosed us from our sins, the one that paid it all, and all to him we owe. Now we trust that this has been of some value and help to the Lord's people in these uh, days of lockdown. It may not be too far away that some form of normality may be able to be returned to, and all of that done within the rules of the Scottish Government and in safety. But we trust that you all be blessed and helped. And even as the word of God has been opened tonight, that it might be a blessing to all concerned. Thank you again for this opportunity uh, 